in, in my case, and in many of our clients' cases at, at our companies, we succeed in part when we learn, begin to learn from others who have, who have conquered and actually gone through it and mastered it. So I, when I was in high school, I read you know Thackeray and Thoreau and Shakespeare, and it's like those are great authors, but when you're like immersed in the criminal justice system, you want to begin to learn from those who have mastered it. Ferenti, Santos, Hopwood, and others. So for me, once I was a convicted felon, I didn't think anything else was possible. I focus on the damaged reputation, embarrassing my family, can never get another job, I can't get a, a license. I'm like, life is over. Who cares, I only got 18 months, it's a life sentence. So for me and many of our clients or people who are going through the system, I would encourage them to begin to learn from those who have been successful despite some insurmountable odds. And then, I not just find someone who's been successful, why are they successful? And you're gonna find that any convicted felon who has had massive amounts of success personally, professionally, physically, whatever it may be, they've done what all successful people have done. They created a goal and they pursued it. They worked on days they didn't want to. They didn't spend their days in prison complaining about their life, the, the unfair situation they're in, much of which could be true. They held themselves accountable. So it sounds very cliche. It almost sounds sort of boring, set goals. The difference is pursuing it on days you may not want to, and that's what I've learned. Everyone talks about wanting to be successful after prison. Are you willing to invest the time and put in the work? So for me, learning from those who actually did it and documented it gave me a roadmap to follow. I tweak it to my own liking. Santos got up at 4 a.m. or 3 a.m., 1 a.m. much of the time that I was in prison. I didn't want to get up at 1 a.m. Some days he'd run a marathon 26 miles. I didn't want to run a marathon, but I wanted to exercise. Someday he'd write 100 letters home. I didn't want to write 100 letters, I'd write three. So I would model those who have done it, tweak it to my own liking. So anyone who I think is immersed in the system, who's wondering what future success will look like, how to rebuild, find a model, emulate what you can, tweak it to your own liking. And if you can do that, you won't default to, I can't get a job as a felon. Life is harder as a felon. There's no opportunities for a felon. There are so many case studies to draw from. You've got to find them and model them because I can assure you those prisoners who are now home have documented it and you've got to want to invest the time to do it. That's what I did. I modeled it and I'm still modeling it. And being in the public eye, you know, not only advocating for prisoners and helping prisoners, but showing yourself as an example. Right. You know, of what you're preaching. You know, with mass incarceration, there's just so many more of us now, but there's still that stigma out there where it's kind of like... So er earlier this week, I received a call from someone who's already finished probation, launching a business, did not have the horrific press releases with his conviction, said, you know, I'm really stunned I didn't get this deal. I thought I was going to get it. You know what's really tough? I said, what? He said, I don't know why I didn't get it. I don't know why if they just found out that I'm a convicted felon or if because I didn't get the deal. And I said, well, did you express to them that you served 18 months in a minimum uh, security camp in Lewisburg? It's like, no, it never came up, I don't talk about it. But now he's left wondering, did I not get the job because I'm a felon? So my approach and suggestion to anyone is, especially in the age of digital media, uh, how easy it is to con conduct a background check, even if there's, you, know, the, you don't have to check the box, I believe they have creative ways to learn if you've served time in federal prison or state prison. And they may not tell you you were not hired because of your incarceration. They can find another reason not to hire you. Okay? If they, so I'm of the opinion you've got to not run from it. In fact, the more you talk about it and address it and address the elephant in the room, the more, the more it's going to help you. I've sort of used the, the M&M analogy from the movie Eight Mile. And you'd appreciate that with your Detroit route. So at the end of Eminem's movie, Eight Mile, he does this rap battle and he wins. And in the rap battle, he says, you know, I am white trash and I do live in a trailer and that guy did sleep with my wife, whatever, whatever, whatever. He addressed all of the, the elephants in the room. Then when he handed the mic to the person with whom he was rapping against, he dropped the mic. There was nothing left for him to say. So to a degree, when I go into meetings or someone who's a convicted felon, or wondering how to deal with the stigma, if they're looking to build a business or get a job, if they could address the elephants in the room as Eminem did, yes, I served some time in prison. I made some bad choices. I'd like to share with you what I've learned, my skill set, and how I can help you moving forward. That alone, people say, I respect you for telling me the truth. People may be intrigued with your journey. It gives you an opportunity to address it. It gives you an opportunity to talk about what your plans are moving forward. So I am a heavy proponent. Despite the criticism, let me be really clear. When I was in prison and I began writing, my family begged me, 
dude, do not write a blog about being in prison. Do not talk about being in prison. You're just gonna bring more attention to yourself. They had good intentions. You think they were embarrassed? They thought it would preclude me from the, the job market. They thought people would always associate me as a felon. And to a degree, people do, even if they don't tell you. So rather than pretend it didn't happen, I talked about it. So that's the advice that I would give to anyone who has a criminal record, who hasn't talked about it, where they go to meetings and parties and it's the elephant in the room that hasn't been addressed. Own it, talk about it. You don't have to build a business around it. You don't have to write a book or blog about it. You don't have to go on TV and talk about it. But people will say to you, hey, that's cool of you. I respect you. In fact, I know of more opportunities where people lost jobs or lost an ability to get funding for a business or employment opportunities. I know of more opportunities where someone did not get the job or opportunities because they didn't disclose it. Later on, the person found out and said, you know, it would have been cool. I'd have still moved forward with you, but you didn't tell me and I found out this way. And that's shady. I don't like that you didn't tell me. That's something I needed to know. Own it, address it. It's better in the long run. There is no doubt. All right, and then, um, you know, this brings me to another question. Like, this is something I will wrestle with, so I want to get your take on it. But, um, I mean, like, like a lot of the stuff, you know, like we, we know what the courts want to hear. We know what the courts yeah. want to say. So, you know, we got to take responsibility. We got to own it. But at the same time, how do we balance that or weigh that with, you know, I mean, like a lot of us know, you know, and it's coming out more and more these days, like in the media and other places. I mean, like the criminal justice system is, is seriously flawed. So, I mean, I, I can see both sides. Like I can see, okay, yeah, you got to own it and, and do this and just move mm -hmm. on. But at the same time, how, how do we address like the root problem, you know, while it's still at the same time, you know, showing a good face or, or trying to keep it moving forward and trying to get everybody the po best possible result? It starts with, it is, so this is something Michael Santos and I used to talk about a lot in prison, where a prisoner would come in and we'd learn about the length of their sentence and we'd learn why the judge gave him five years even when the prosecutor may have asked for three. And we look at their personal narrative, we look at the statement they made, we look at their probation report, or we couldn't see it, they would tell us what was in the probation report. And in their eyes, they were telling the truth. Some of the pressures, the rationalizations they faced in breaking the law. The judge or prosecutor, of course, used that as an excuse, as the reason they broke the law, not fully accepting responsibility. So it's not enough to tell someone to, be, to, to tell the truth. In many cases, that could lead to, to more trouble. But what I think we have to do is, beyond telling the truth, be somewhat strategic in understanding the stakeholders. Who are they? The judge is probably a former prosecutor, maybe of the fraud division, who's prosecuted thousands of guys. What is the, or the judge, I should say, is probably a former prosecutor. The prosecutor is uh, looking to advance his career, his agenda, someday become a defense attorney who's going to command a thousand bucks an hour. With my conviction, the first thing on the U.S. Attorney's website, once he became a defense attorney in downtown L.A., was my conviction, which increased his resume, which would help him justify the wages. So I tell all def defendants, you may not agree with the government's version of events. If you're going to plead guilty, as much as it may trouble you, you've got to totally own and acknowledge it. If you sign a plea agreement and say, some say something different, they're going to say, well, here he, here he goes again. He's excusing or blaming his conduct. So there's a policy question of locking too many people up. Then there's the question of what can I do to get the shortest sanction in the most favorable institution? How can I convey to a judge I'm sorry and I'm remorseful? In our companies, we believe some, sometimes, even if you don't fully agree with your plea agreement, if you signed it, you've got to own it. You've got to acknowledge conduct. You've got to identify with victims, which is often hard in, in many cases, especially with white collar crime, Seth. Insider trading, it can be hard to argue who the victim is. Tax, a, a tax case, who's the victim? It's all of us US taxpayers, I get it. The victims in many of these cases are the wife, the kids, the children. So in addressing the issue of remorse and getting the best sentence, you've got to understand the stakeholder, you've got to understand that judges and prosecutors are cynical, and you've got to, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, not all business deals are easy, some deals suck, some deals you just have to get done, this is a business deal that you don't love, and if your goal is to get the best outcome, it may require you to convey some remorse and shame you don't feel. It may require you to identify with victims, even if you think they're made up, that you may not feel. And if you can do that the right way, the proper way, 
and not just outsource it to a lawyer. We work with a lot of lawyers, but as you know, lawyers are paid to talk about why their clients are good people and their conduct was aberrational and they'll never do it again. It's what they're paid to say, and I pray they do it well. In order to get the shortest sentence or to wrap up this very bad business deal, they've got to be able to express through their own words that they truly are remorseful and sorry. And I don't think enough defendants do that. I think too many defendants rationalize and too many defendants simply outsource to the work to their lawyer and they get longer prison terms as a result. The hardest part in many cases for a white collar defendant is the time before prison because you're wondering and worrying what the sentence is going to look like. My sentencing was actually better than my guilty plea because at least at sentencing I had clarity. And then when I was in prison, I used to hear men talk about how scared they were to go home. Even guys who served two, three, four years. Right, and I'm thinking like, gosh, you've only served three years or two years or a year and a day. You're out of here in seven months with halfway house and good time you're scared to go home, and well, why is that? Well, they, they don't know what they're gonna do for work, and they don't know what they're gonna do to sustain their family, and they don't know how they're gonna pay the restitution back. Or in many cases, they didn't wanna start at a job that was beneath their skill set. So in my case, my transition required a totally and complete humbling of myself. I was no longer a stockbroker who made big money. I, as a result of my choices, I, I killed that life. I was a released prisoner in a tough climate in 2009, starting over, really with nothing other than an ability to work hard and some discipline. So my transition wasn't fun. People think, oh, you're gonna get out, you're immediately gonna wanna eat everything inside and have sex because you've been in. I wasn't focused on eating and I wasn't focused on sex. I was focused on, I'm a convicted felon. What can I do to ensure this isn't a lifelong sanction? What can I do to pay victims back and pay my damn health insurance and not have to go to friends or family for help? So for me, the transition was not fun. It was hard, waking every day, dealing with massive amounts of rejection, but in time, by creating good content, whether it was a blog, a book, a YouTube video, white collar advice, a speaking at a conference, in time, if you put out enough good content and you're genuine and you wanna help people, then the phone began to ring. It's like, wow, I'm, hey, I've read your blog about prison or I read your blog about what you would do differently before going in. What does it take to work with you? And I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. Then one month in April of 14, seven clients had us and we had down there our first six figure month. And I'm like, wow, five years out of jail, we're going to take in six figures this month helping people. But it was building content and value every day, seven days a week over a five year period of time that started when I was back in prison. So the transition wasn't fun. It wasn't that enjoyable to be home. Some days in prison were easier with a job that took me 30 minutes and running, no bills, no expenses, subsidized by the taxpayer, living in a minimum security camp, coming home with a probation officer saying, send more money. I won't let you work with felons as a prison consultant. Why are you going to speak? You're not getting paid enough money. No, I'm not gonna let you travel to New York for two extra days to cultivate relationships. Then, you know, telling a woman on a date, yeah, I just got out of jail. It's like, oh, what, the hell does, what the hell does that look like? Are you joking? No, I'm not joking. I just got out of federal prison. Then it, of course, dominates the whole conversation. So I'm not complaining or excusing. I want to be clear. I'm not bitching at all. I had it better than most. But you ask about my transition. The transition was probably better for me than most because I had a very brief sentence. But it was not fun. And I didn't spend it. The only way I spent it was working and providing value and providing content. There was, and people used to say to me, dude, relax, just scale back, enjoy yourself a little bit, you're home. And I couldn't, I'm comparing myself to friends who have built you know, multi-million dollar businesses, who were thriving, who were married with children. I had no business that was really thriving yet. I wasn't married, I had no children, I wasn't, no, I'm not taking the afternoon off to go watch a movie, like I have to work. So and that's how White Collar Advice grew and grew and grew. I provided content, we were authentic, and had a lot of continuing guidance with Michael Santos, even though he was still in prison, finishing his 45 year prison term. Email had now come in prison, remember we emailed? Email changed everything for us because now he and I are emailing all freaking day. At first we couldn't, because when I left my probation officer said no contact with Santos. I couldn't visit him, I couldn't email him. It was very difficult, because like my mentor and wingman still in prison, we can't talk for a little while. So with email, it really began to change things and then Michael came home and we just, we've spent full time growing it together. But it's, it's like 12, 13 years in the making of a lot of very long days, all focused on creating content. And if we create content, our goal is some people may call and say, hey, what does it take to work with you? Or what is that? 
I saw this program at resilientcourses.com. What is that monthly membership program like? What do I get? It all started inside of a prison quiet room with Michael Santos asking me, so what do you do when you go home? How can you help people? And how does that help yourself? It all started from prison. Anyone going to prison or has a loved one in prison who's watching this should be holding their loved one accountable and asking, what are you doing all day in federal prison? That's how it started. <coughs> why don't you, um, I know Resilient Courses is a new thing you guys are launching. So why don't you kind of like talk about that or give an overview? So resiliencecourses.com, Michael Santos and I are building it out. And it started because, well, several months ago, there was this Washington Post article on our company. I had this, we had this cover piece in the Washington Post, which went like crazy viral, like, like 10 to 15 million people. And from that, there's been a lot of press and attention, which we're grateful for. However, there have been thousands of people that reached out to us who needed our help, but they couldn't afford to pay my private consulting rates. And I understand it, not everyone can, but if we're gonna invest the time and write, there's, this is our expertise. This is what we're the best in the world at, we think. So I used to convey to Michael, wow, there's someone who reached out or left a message who, with whom we could really help getting off supervised release early, telling their kids, which could be a 20 minute call that they're going to prison, but we can't respond and help everyone. So Michael said, well, let's not complain about it. Let's fix the problem. Let's create a process that enables us to help tens of thousands of people who may go into, who are in, or who are going to come home through the criminal justice system. So resiliencecourses.com, primarily through right now, our master's reframe program for a modest monthly fee, we're gonna, uh, with daily content from Michael and me, we're going to be able to work with anyone, regardless of what your budget is. Any question you may have about the criminal justice system, from a DUI to a state or federal crime, we're going to be providing content on a daily basis. For where, wherever you are in the process, you're going in, we can help you. You're in, we can help you. You're home from prison, which can be the hardest part. Here's resources on building a business, working with your probation officer. So resiliencecourses.com is, is a tool or platform that ena enables us to work with anyone who is immersed in the criminal justice system in any way, through daily content, through bi-weekly webinars where we answer all of their questions, teach and instruct, where white collar advice is more the individual one-on-one -on -one consulting, which can become more expensive for the defendant who has the resources to, you know, to invest in that. Resiliencecourses.com is daily content that will enable us to reach hundreds of thousands of people. Anyone that has a felony conviction or as under investigation, we'll find value in that. It's more for the masses, and we're investing hundreds of hours and a lot of money to grow it and market it properly. All right, and then, um, I, don't, I don't know, I think if you talked about this, but why don't you talk, you know, because you've been doing prison consulting, and like, uh, you know, I've, I've seen the pieces, you know, you've been featured in, but there's been like a lot of pieces, like even that movie, you know, Get Hard, yeah. you know, about prison consulting and stuff like that. So. Um, just talk about you know your 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 kind of opinion of the different aspects of the field or, or how it's generated and how you think it's it, you guys do some do it different. The it's a it's a sordid industry. Uh, many lawyers frown on prison consultants because some play jailhouse lawyer. They offer guarantees, and they prey on the vulnerabilities of a defendant. A defendant has a high paid point. You're scared, oh my God, you can give me money, take my credit card, without a clearly defined scope or measurables. So it's a sordid industry, as you know, some consultants earlier this year were, were indicted uh, for helping people get into the drug program e illegally. So I've been trying to professionalize this, this industry. I've been trying to demand that defendants get clearly defined scopes of work, that they insist on a payment plan so you're holding the, account the consultant accountable over time, that we're not preying on the vulnerabilities of defendants. So I have found the more attention our company has received, uh, the more it has angered some. Uh, I have been involved in several defamation suits with people who defamed me anonymously and had to hire a lawyer, Kenton Hutchinson, in Dallas, Texas, to sue them and anonymously find out who wrote it. And there are people that you'll see on YouTube. There are people that claim to be ethical and fair and honest and have your best interest at heart. And, Yet behind the scenes, they're anonymously defaming people online. Yes, I've settled. Yes, I suppose there have been retractions and it's coming down. But it doesn't, and even though I get a judgment, they don't have any money. And I don't even want the money. I want to hold them accountable. I want people to know that people say one thing and do another. And I want people to ask more questions. In our case, for example, I'll tell a prospect, would you like to speak with five clients? 
Would you like to speak with three? Speak with 10 clients. They're going to tell you the good, the bad, what they learned, how it worked, was it worth the money? Uh, talk to them. Do your vetting. Do your due diligence. So a goal of mine, until I drop dead, I want to clean up this industry. I want lawyers to recognize that so much of what we do is not just prison advice, but business advice, managing businesses from prison, being an entrepreneur, coming home, starting over. What really happens after sentencing? It's not just get out early for RDAP. If you're not ready to come home, who cares, Seth, if you got the extra year off? If you're not ready, who cares? You have a whole new set of problems on the other side. So my goal is to clean up this industry, to continue to hold people accountable who say one thing and do another. And recognize that just because someone says they can help you, it doesn't mean they can. Right? For years, people have, were stealing Michael Santos's content, and now my content, or collaboratively, our content. I've had to reach out to consultants and say, look, if you want our help, fine. You literally just took our content and put it on your site. Do you not, have the, do you not even know to change the noun or verb to even make it look like it's yours? It's easier to steal than create it. But even if they've stolen it, they don't understand it. They can't, they can't teach it. So, some say it's a little off-putting, it's a little arrogant. I don't, I'm not saying there aren't other people that provide value. I'm encouraging anyone to do their due diligence, to ask the right questions, and I pray to God I can continue to professionalize this industry. In the last year, we got more referrals from lawyers, Seth, than we did in the prior five years combined. And it's because of the vetting. It's because of the outcomes. It's because we have clients that call their lawyer and say, you were against me hiring him. I hired him anyway. We got an outcome. The judge talked about my work at sentencing and the outcome I got was because of what I did with them and also you, you need to give a second look. You judge them improperly. Then I'll speak with the lawyer and I'll say, why? And I'll say, well, I thought you were going to play lawyer and I thought you were going to you know, make my job worse. And so the referrals from lawyers have become because we've worked together. So that's the way it will continue to be. So it's a long answer to a short question. People need to do their due diligence, ask the right questions. If not, they'll be exploited, leveraged off of, and then it just continues the patterns of pain. And um, I'm very passionate about that because it's gone on for too long. All right, and I want you to um, kind of talk about, uh, you know, transparency. You know, like when, I mean, we, we, we kind of brushed over it a lot. You know, we kind of talk about it more in depth. Just the importance, you know, being transparent, especially like when you're an ex-con. Yep. And, I mean, I know you, you kind of get a little thing about the elephant in the room, but if you can like just break down, you know, like the importance, you know, even to you in the individual sense, if you can take it to that level. So the more I run towards and talk about my conduct and my crime <clears throat> and what I've learned from it, the more opportunities come my way. Uh, real estate agent, doctors, lawyers, other people come to me and say, can you help me with marketing? Can I pay you to do that? Can we collaboratively work together on a book? And I'll say, well, what? What brings you to this idea? And they'll say, well, I read some of your writing. I love what you wrote, how you talked about your case. I see your skill set. I think you can help me. The more I talk about it and own it, the more freeing it is. I don't feel as if I'm running from anything. There were many days. I did 100 media interviews after the Washington Post article came out. I think I did 100 radio, TV, podcasts, paper type interviews, maybe 100 inside of a couple of weeks. And it was very surreal because I, I reflect back on like coming home from prison, wishing the phone would ring and walking into law offices and getting thrown out to the point where I someday, one day I missed like seven interviews because I, I was booked. I couldn't get to it. And some of these were like with some major players. And it was surreal to get all of that attention, still continuing to get it from studios, reaching out, offering to buy the rights and working on shows. And so it's been incredibly surreal. It's been, none of it has gone to my head because I know at the end of the day, I'm a convicted felon who made some bad choices. And I do believe that I'm, by doing it the right way for a long time, it's helped a lot of people. I think the attention continues to help a lot of people. I did the Dr. Phil show a 90 minute interview and I shared this with Dr. Phil's team recently, more than a thousand people after that interview reached out to get a copy of Lessons from Prison for free. And till this day I continue to get emails from people that say I was afraid to talk about my case, I was afraid to talk about my time in prison, I was afraid to talk about this and your story encouraged me to come out and talk about it. I only regret is I wish I did it years or decades ago. So the media attention has been great for business, it's been great for branding, 
the vetting they did on us, I joke, I don't know if they vet politicians the way the Washington Post did or CNN or Fox, which is great, by the way. And everything I said they vetted, which they should. I assure you they weren't running that work unless they vetted what I told them. That was good because everything I said we were able to back up. So the vetting process has been great because then it's then good for branding, which helps business. But it's also been able to help a lot of people. But it's surreal. My wife and I went out to dinner and someone recognized I had done the Dana Perina show on Fox. And it's led to an incredibly productive and fulfilling life where people will come up to me and say, man, I, I read about your story. It's incredibly inspiring. And I think I've done something worse in my life. I didn't get caught. You know, we hear, we hear a lot of that from people. So the transparency for me has changed everything of pretending this didn't happen, never wanting to pretend that I didn't go to prison, never pretending I didn't create victims, never pretending I didn't embarrass my family. But the goal by being transparent is to show what I've become or who I'm striving to become. And then people can make their own decision. They can look at my life before prison. They can look at my life after prison and compare it alongside one another. And I hope that people say he's lived a pretty productive life despite it. So everyone that reaches out to me who's home from prison, they're afraid to talk about it. They're struggling to find work. They're in a six month relationship with a woman and they've yet to disclose they've been to prison and they don't, may not understand how that may be disrespectful to her. Perhaps she should know that you served three years in prison for stealing $7 million from people. And of course, their default is, well, maybe she'll judge me and not know who I am because I, I can ra rationalize it anyway, I assure you, okay? And then they don't live, they're not free. They're not living authentically. They're concerned she's going, in this case, concerned she's going to find out. What do I do when it comes up? So I believe in addressing it. That Eminem analogy at the end of that movie makes the most sense. Address everything in the room. And the beauty, Seth, and what I've learned, of all the dates I went on when I came home from prison, and I'm now you know, married with two kids, one girl said, very nice girl, she said, you know, my father's a doctor in Manhattan and he would freak out if he knew I was dating a guy out of jail. I said, Total, totally get it. I'll, I wasn't trying to convince her, I had my dignity, I'm not gonna sell her. One, all of some of the business deals I've done since I've come home, one person has said, yeah, that's really outside. I'm not really comfortable with the felony conviction thing. It's just kind of weird for me. Totally good, I'm not gonna sell you, it's all good. That's like two out of hundreds of various scenarios. I believe it's worse if you're not transparent, if you don't disclose it, if you don't own it, because eventually if someone finds out, they're gonna say, I'd have been cool with it, but you didn't tell me. And I get more of those calls, Seth. So I'll close with, you don't have to disclose it as our company suggests. You don't have to do it by a blog or a book or a YouTube video or going on TV or doing movies or shows. This is my business. Okay, I, I don't run from it. You don't have to do it to that degree, but you have to do it to some degree, even if it's privately as you're looking for work. And those that can do that, I think, have better futures all the way around, financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually, every way. I, I highly encourage it. And that's some of the things we cover in the at resiliencecourses.com, telling the story effectively without excusing not getting so into the conduct where you kind of lose people in the weeds, but expressing what happened and then your plans moving forward. It takes a lot of practice too. You just don't show up to someone and say, hey, I got out of jail, will you hire me? There's gotta be some work and investment behind it. So that comes back to what type of books are you reading? What type of literature? It's like a full-time job, Seth, from my experience to, to, to do it the right way. And it's a full-time job when you may have two full-time jobs and a wife, of, wife and kids to support. It ain't easy, I know but I think that's what it takes. We're, we're building a community that focuses on the obvious, which is how to best prepare for sentencing, how to hold your lawyer accountable, how to convey to the judge that you're different than your plea agreement, that you're better than bad choices. From there, we transition into having the most productive prison experience. A lot of people in a minimum security camp or a low will say, oh, it's so boring here. In many of these cases, it's not violence in prison, it's boredom that, that takes up so many people's days. So we'll transition and teach to how to have the most productive prison experience, how to spend your days productively, preparing to come home, developing new skills, avoiding staff, avoiding disciplinary infractions, avoiding complaining all day, preparing to come home. And then so much of our content will be geared towards the post-prison market. Coming home with a solid reputation, looking for work, interviews, employment, relationships. If you're an entrepreneur, how do you start a new, new business? Well, every felon tends to get fired from their bank, at least the white collar defendant. Fired from the bank 
can't, can't get a loan? How do, we ma how do we manage that? So it's really going to be every aspect of the criminal justice system, but knowing how many people are home from prison who are struggling and need help, knowing that they may not be able to pay me a five-figure consulting fee, because they may just have two questions. They may need, need continuing guidance from those who have learned and mastered this experience. Two, three hours a month of webinars and daily content may get them over the, may help them tell their story, may get them there. That's something that we'll be able to offer and provide in lieu of my guiding them personally day by day, one on one. There's only so much bandwidth we have, only so much one on one consulting that we can have. And a lot of that individual consulting tends to lean towards the pre sentencing, sentencing and preparing for prison. So the resilience courses will. You're a felon, we're a felon for the rest of our life. We're, I'm still dealing with issues because of my felony conviction 10 or 11 years later, whether it's getting invitations to speak, I can't leave, leave the country. Banks continuing to, to close my uh, accounts. I mean, we, you know it, we can go on, for, we can go on for, for days and days and days. So the post-prison market is significant and we wanna help more people prepare for it and invest the time to overcome it. And not, go, not just not go back to prison, that's a very modest goal, I think, not returning. It's like, are you thriving? And what type of record are you beginning to create? I think the biggest mis misperception is probably that someone who has a felony conviction is probably born bad and has just always lacked character. And reform is not possible. I would argue our former attorney general thought that way you know, from, uh, from Alabama, I think it was. So I think, that's the mis I think that's the misperception. Of course, it's wrong. Uh, good people can make bad choices. Good people can, I mean, look at Josh Boyer. I think you know Josh. Josh was 17 years in prison, just had a sentence, uh, probation terminated this week, and got a sentence commuted by the president. And he made a couple of bad, well, I think one bad choice that led to like a 25-year prison term. He wasn't born bad. He made some bad choices. He associated perhaps with some of the wrong people. So I think that's the biggest misperception that People to this day will say, oh, you're a white collar criminal, you lack character, you're greedy, you're entitled, you're shallow. Until this day, I, despite the record I've created, despite the evidence. So I, we talked earlier about transparency. If you can talk about what you've learned, what you've shared, who you've become, it debunks that misperception that you're just born bad. Or you went to prison, it's the only time, is this the only time you got caught? You know, in my case manager said that to me one time. And, in prison, and that's just the perception. We're just we're just bad, and that is so not the case. I mean, that is just that's just so not the case. At least for the majority of people, they're good people who made some bad choices, who want to become better, and sometimes lack the opportunities to. Um, well, they've made some bad choices, but I don't think they're born bad. How much I can tell you. So there are some great success stories of former prisoners who have built businesses as, as entrepreneurs. And if you were to ask them why they succeeded, you'd look back to probably how they served their time in prison. They begin to learn things like, what is an LLC? What is, what is a partnership? How should I create a, a business as, as, a, as an entrepreneur? You begin to, it starts with a recognition that I might not be able to get a license. I think as a felon, you can't even cut hair because we're not allowed to use scissors. Can't be a lawyer, can't be a doctor, can't be a real estate agent. Can't go, can't go work for a bank as a teller. So it's the realization that there's a lot of, you're cut off from a big part of the job market. And then thinking, what, I, what could I be good at? How could I help someone? What content or value can I, can I provide? So clients of ours have started like frozen food businesses, software companies, just a, a regular online store that sells underwear and pants and shoes, the vaping business. We have some clients that have built huge businesses. Many of them have never went to college or had a business background. There's this default that maybe because I went to USC and I was a broker, it was easier. I didn't have digital marketing skills when I went to, to prison. I certainly didn't have them when I came home. I just had a willingness to embrace the reality. I can't go get a job as a stockbroker anymore. How can I provide value? So I would suggest to anyone who has, has an experience in the system, who is in a position to want to help people and build a business, could they create something? Could they then sell it? If they don't have the time to create it, is there a product that exists today that they believe in? I don't care what the product is. Grow your, your hair back, okay? Get in better shape. Have a better relationship with your wife. Have more sex. I don't care what it is. There's a product that's been created. And 
I assure you, I, believe, I shouldn't say sure, I believe someone who created that product would be happy to let you sell it and you get a little piece of what you sell. So but you have to have some digital marketing skills. You have to have some understanding of business and that's why it comes back to reading the right books. What books are you reading? Uh, are you willing to invest the time knowing there may be no immediate payoff, immediate money coming in? And can you have a five or 10 year view or a one year view? So I would think immediately, the first question, what, do I, what am I passionate about? What am I good at? And if someone can identify what they're passionate about, what they're good at, someone's created that product, go sell it on their behalf and you'll get some commission or go create it yourself. I have a client who's in great shape. He's building out, he's just not a trainer. He's building out like kind of like a do-it-yourself training course. And I know the market's saturated, dude. I know there's millions of them, I get it. But if you're good at it, you're gonna stand out. He wanted to be an entrepreneur. He wanted to help people get fit and strong. And rather than just do it one-on-one -on -one all day, we're helping him create a program with DVD, online, generating traffic from YouTube. It all started from him getting in great shape in prison and wanting to help more people. That's what it takes. Anyone can do it. If you don't have time to create it, someone else has created it, find if you can create a relationship where you can sell it and share in those revenues. That's the way it starts. Same thing at BrazilianCourses.com. We're creating a mechanism where people who may be home from prison, who have a passion for it, who want to help, we're going to be, we'll have a system where people can sell, sell our program. There'll be some vetting, of course, some training. It's not just, here's the URL, go sell it, we'll send you money. That's insane. Some training, and if they complete the training, we have a mechanism, a platform, a process where they could sell it and be a part of our team and, and earn a modest wage and also help people if they have interest in reform in the criminal justice system. There's a lot of those out there. I like my family when they say that they're, they're proud of me. My parents tell me they're proud of me. And, you know, my children, my daughter's five and my son is 15 months and I hope someday like we talk about transparency, like they'll see that I owned it, I talked about it, I learned from it, and they'll never be ashamed to say their father went to prison. And so for me, in the press guy, I'm not ashamed of what I did, I've learned from it, I've become better, and I think the press properly conveys that, conveys how we help people, conveys that we believe people can become better. So I'm proud of the press. It's not about violence in prison and drumming up business to scare people. It's authentic, real, about what this experience is like. And I frequently say, coming home is the hardest part. Are you ready? Are you preparing? Sounds boring, not as exciting as, are there violence and shanks in prison? I don't talk about any of that. That's not on my YouTube. Do not come to my YouTube channel for that. You ain't going to get it. If you do, unsubscribe. That's not what I talk about. It is, what does success after prison look like? What does the plan look like to get there? And I think that's covered properly in a lot of the media attention. And for that, I'm grateful. It's a long answer, but I'll say I'm, it's humbling. And I feel like all those years of hard work of waking early, I don't want to say pay off is the word, but the recognition was nice. Because some people told me I was crazy, dude. Like, hey, did you ever hear some of that? Like, you're nuts for, yeah, like crazy. No. When I was in, when I was in, when I started telling them I want to write articles and write books, and they were like, yeah, I, I have a lot of like, you do that? who's going to pay you for that? <laughs> yeah. that? That, it was a little bit satisfying as well, because there were people that, we're like, I remember I was on a date one time and she's like, so um, people like pay you to do what? And I could tell she was assessing, am I someday gonna be able to support her and a family? I'm like, I knew where she was getting at in like three seconds. She basically called what I did nuts and crazy and like she doesn't get the model. Uh, which is very, very funny in retrospect. But I got a lot of that, a lot of that. And um, you know, it's nice to, I don't want to say feel vindicated, but it is somewhat nice to just go down your own path and take the risk. You're a trailblazer. To go down your own path, even when people say you're effing nuts and crazy, and uh, some people still say I'm nuts and crazy by talking so openly about it. You know, it's my life. You know, I don't want to look back with regrets. I'm going to be dead and gone someday, and those that love and support me, I want them to be able to say he lived productively and he helped people. That's that's worth more to me than concerns about what people who don't know me think. All right. Okay. All right. I think we're good, man. So we're out. Good. Cool. Straight awesome. up. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.